Hi, Mahesh Thapa here again from Seattle Children's, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about buckle fractures. When we should call them buckle fractures, when we should not, and to recognize some of the difference between buckle and non-buckle. Now, you know, for us it's important, I guess, to distinguish the different types of fractures, like Salter Harris injuries, or green stick fractures, or displaced complete fractures. But for practical purposes in the ER and urgent care, we really only have to distinguish between buckle and non-buckle because that determines what the pathway for management for these patients are. If it's a buckle fracture, a true buckle fracture, then it goes, goes along another pathway where the treatment is more conservative, maybe just a, a prefabricated uh, splint, as opposed to a non-buckle fracture, which we're going to treat for all practical purposes as unstable, and this may need orthopedic consult, it may need a cast being placed, maybe internal fixation, uh, not sure, it all depends on the severity, degree of angulation, degree of displacement, how much of the physis is involved. But for the purposes of what needs to be conveyed to the clinicians, particularly in the urgent care or ER setting, we just want to distinguish between buckle and non-buckle. Now, there is a lot of controversy out there in the radiology literature about what should be called buckle. And what I really urge everybody to do is talk to your own department, talk to your urgent care people, ER people, orthopedics, and come up with a plan and a nomenclature about what you're going to distinguish between buckle and non-buckle. It'll save you a lot of headaches later on as far as getting emails about, you know, why was this called this and not that. So that is basically the first steps that we took at Seattle Children's was to sort of gather everybody together and come up with a definition that everybody was happy with, okay? So let's move on. In this talk, I'm going to show you 10 examples of distal radius fractures and approach it in a way that I try to give you some reasoning behind why I would call it a buckle fracture or not a buckle fracture. And hopefully you take something away from this and can incorporate it into your own practice, hopefully after you have talked to your own department and clinical services. So a distal radial buckle fracture basically is the result of axial loading usually on an outstretched hand, like so the so-called foosh injury fall on an outstretched hand. Now there are two sides basically that we want to consider. There is the compression side and there is the tension side. And on the compression side is where the convexity, the fracture occurs while the tension side is often left intact. Now, again, with extensive discussion with our various services, we came to realize that we were overcalling buckle fractures by the clinical definition, by the surgical definition. And it did really have an impact on the management and morbidity of these patients. So we came up with our definition of what a buckle fracture should be. And you can use this as, as a guide to sort of help you come up with your own definition. What we said is the following. Simple dorsal buckle fractures will be restricted to buckling of the dorsal cortex without extension of fracture line to the volar cortical surface and fracture angulation should be less than five degrees. Now, literature says 10 degrees, but we wanted to be ultra conservative and left it at five degrees. If there is frank disruption of the cortical surface, it is no longer classified as buckle fracture. We also came up with this following corollary, if you will, and this applies to the older child, somebody who's maybe seven, eight, nine years or older, and this is what we came up with. An isolated distal radius fracture in a child seven years or older is not likely to be a buckle fracture if the fracture to physis distance is less than one centimeter. This is a roundabout way of saying that the closer the fracture is to the physis, particularly in a child who's a little older, the less likely it's going to be a buckle fracture, the more likely it's going to be something like a Salter Harris type of injury, Salter Harris 2 or what have you. So let's go over a few cases and, and I'll tell you what I think these fractures are. Here is an eight year, eight month old child with a wrist injury. And if we look at the frontal and lateral radiograph, we notice that the, the bottom of the fracture to the physis distance is about 16 millimeters. There's no significant angulation to the fracture. Certainly that's less than five degrees. 
and we have no significant cortical break on either the lateral or the frontal projection, and I would be very comfortable calling this a buccal fracture. Here is a second case. This is a seven-year, two-month-old child with a distal radius fracture. Now, looking at the frontal and lateral radiograph, the frontal, it's kind of subtle and hard to detect, but the lateral, I think, shows the fracture very clearly. The fracture line, basically from the bottom of the fracture to the physis, is about 10 and a half millimeters. Uh, and unlike the other exam, there really isn't a significant quote unquote buckling or contour deformity. There's actually a frank lucency through the distal aspect of the radius with fracture line extending to the physis. So this is not a buckle fracture. This is a Salter-Harris II injury of the distal radius. Now here is another radiograph. Yes, there is an ulna injury, but for the sake of this presentation, we're gonna to stick to just the radius. So this is a five year, eight month old child with distal radius injury. And we notice that the line, the fracture line to physis distance, again, drawn always from the bottom of the fracture line. You can make it on the frontal or lateral. I find it's usually much easier on the lateral view because um, the concavities and the, and the angulations are much more conspicuous. So that distance is 14 millimeters. Uh, there's no significant angulation between the distal fracture fragment and the proximal portion of that radius. Uh, and again, no significant cortical break that I can detect. So I would be comfortable calling this a simple dorsal buccal fracture. One more case. Now this is a child is five years and six months of age. We, here's a lateral and frontal radiograph. Here, this fracture looks a little different, doesn't it? There's no multiple points of inflection, if you will. There's only one point of inflection right here at the distal radius. Now that rule about the one centimeter doesn't quite apply here because the child is in seven years, but still this is awfully close to the growth plate. And because the lack of two inflection points and the acute angulation over here and pretty close proximity to the physis, I would not classify this as a simple dorsal fracture. Now, some literature I've looked at says they would classify this as an angulated buccal fracture, but I think that still leads to a lot of confusion because the word buccal is in it and people think, oh, this is a stable fracture, nothing needs to be done. This is more likely to be a Salter Harris II injury. And that's sort of what we called and the orthopedic surgeons agreed with us because this patient eventually did get casted. Okay, so that's what I initially thought about this case, but after showing it to several orthopedic surgeons, sports medicine doctors and radiologists, there is a little difference in opinion. Some people feel this is a buccal fracture because there is no clear extension to the physis and the child is less than seven years of age and there's no significant angulation and there's no what's called a Thurston Holland fragment. That's a little metaphyseal fragment that you typically see with Salter Harris injuries. So there is uh, some controversy and some debate about what this is. And even in the literature, uh, sometimes this is referred to, as I said, as an angulated buccal fracture and called stable. And sometimes literature says this is not a stable fracture. I think the best thing to do is describe it and say that it may reach the physis, but uh, you know, don't come down hard or anything and let the clinicians and orthopedic surgeons decide how they want to handle this. Uh, that's the best advice I have. So, no, I have no absolute answers for you guys, but out of all the cases that I have shown, this one is the one that people sort of had a little angst over and disagreed over. So take that for what it's worth. Here is a nine-year-old, eight-month uh, patient and fracture line to physis distance is about 16 millimeters. But unlike the other buccal fractures, we see that there is in fact some cortical breakthrough over here. The continuity is lacking between this part of the cortex and this part of the cortex. Again, we're gonna ignore the distal ulna for now. Uh, on, although there is no significant angulation and the fracture distance is greater than 10 millimeters, this suggestion of cortical breakthrough tells me that this is not a simple buccal fracture. I would call this a transverse incomplete fracture. Incomplete because I don't clearly see a fracture line extending all the way through to the volar cortex. Here's one more case. 
this is a five-year-old. Now that fracture line distance, again, doesn't really apply so much, but I'm gonna draw it for all the cases. That's about 21 or 22 millimeters or 2.2 centimeters. There is, quote unquote, some buckling of that dorsal cortex. However, we can see that the fracture line extends all the way to the volar surface, and we can see that lucency, the, we know that this is probably some break in the cortex on the other side. The fracture line extends through here, and this angulation, if we measured it, I think would clearly be more than five degrees, and perhaps not quite 10 degrees, but it does not meet criteria for buccal fracture. So this I would again classify as a transverse complete fracture. Here's another case. This is a 10 year old. Now the fracture line to Pfizer's distance is 14 millimeters. So, uh, you know, it would say, oh, maybe this, this is a, a buccal fracture because distance is so long. However, look at the cortex on the dorsal side. It is definitely discontinuous. You can see that here on the frontal projection also. Not a lot of angulation, but the fact but the fact the fracture line here goes through the cortex means it's probably a Salta Harris II injury. And other evidence of that is sort of extension of this lucency up towards the physis. And the dorsal aspect of that physis is clearly wider than the volar aspect. So a Salta Harris II injury. One more case. This is, again, a fall on an outstretched hand on a 15-year-old. The fracture line to physis distance is at about 15 millimeters. I'm looking at this, I'm saying, well, there's not a lot of angulation and I don't see a fracture line extending to the volar cortical surface. But if I look at the dorsal side, I see that there is frank discontinuity between this cortex and the quote unquote buckled cortex. So this is not a simple buckle fracture. And I would classify this as a transverse incomplete fracture. One more case, I think this is the second to last one. We have here a seven year, 11 month old patient. We can clearly see without anything else that there is discontinuity of the cortex. So by definition, this is not a simple buccal fracture. This is probably a transverse incomplete because I don't clearly see a fracture line extending to the volar surface and there isn't a lot of angulation. Again, we're ignoring the uh, distal ulnar fracture for now. Okay, here is our final case. This is a 10 year, 11 month old patient, frontal and lateral radiograph. This is the volar side, this is the dorsal side. We can already see that this fracture is a little different. The area of abnormality is predominantly on the volar surface. So some people have called this a volar buckle fracture. Again, I like not to use the word buckle in anything that's not truly going to be an unstable fracture. So because it's the crunch, if you will, is on the volar surface, this is not a simple dorsal buccal fracture. Uh, literature says that these often need to be uh, immobilized, perhaps not casted, maybe splinted, but immobilized in an extension position uh, to make sure that there is no further angulation or for further displacement of this fracture. Even though the fracture line is more than 22 millimeters from the physis, it still is not categorized as a simple buccal fracture. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense and you could walk through some of my rationale uh, based on what my discussions were with the uh, orthopedic and sports medicine team. Here are a few references if you want to look them up and uh, we'll see you next time.